Well, hey, again, it has been so awesome to worship with you already today. I'm excited about this message. We're starting a brand new series of messages, as a matter of fact, over the month of April, and we're calling it Searching. I don't know if you're aware of this, but every year on Google alone, there are 8.5 billion searches, and I'm pretty sure I'm like 30 million of those just in in my uh, searches alone every year, and they're just people like you and me that are curious, right? We're looking for that next meal that we want to eat. We're looking for the Yelp review. We're we're trying to find directions. Uh, This is me all the time. We're trying to settle a debate between my wife and I or my kids and I, and we're letting the internet be the tiebreaker. Do you ever do that? Anybody else really good? You know exactly how to phrase the question so the internet answers that you're the right one. You know what I'm talking about? I'm real. That's like my superpower. It's, it's funny, though. It's like I cannot think of a day in recent history, I'm talking years, where I didn't go to Google for something. 8.5 billion, and that's just Google alone all across the world. And so today, we're going to be kicking off this series, and we're going to talk about a search that's a little bit deeper than just searching on the internet. We're gonna talk about something that all of us are doing down deep inside of our souls. And I'm really convinced of this. I believe that the story of Easter can be summed up with that one word, with searching. And so I wanna just real quick do something because I recognize that in this room, there's a whole lot of people that are coming from different places. How many of y'all kind of grew up in church? Like on some level, you grew up in church. How many didn't grow up in church much at all? Like this is kind of a new thing. Yeah, that's, BC is a healthy mix of that, and so I recognize that some of us have heard this story a million times, and maybe today my challenge and the thing that I hope to do is to help you to see Easter and look through a different lens, see it from a different perspective, and some of you, this is going to be the first time you've heard the story of creation and the fall and redemption, and that's amazing, and so we're going to talk about how it all started, and it all started at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. God makes everything that we can see. He makes, he makes the flowers and the trees, and he makes the ocean, and he makes the fish in the sea, and then, of course, he makes the beasts in the field, and, and he makes the birds in the air. And then on the sixth day, God says, it's missing something, and it was you and it was me. He makes man and woman. And then at the end of all of it, he looks at his creation, and he says, this is good. I did a good thing today. And so it's interesting because man and woman, the first ones, Adam and Eve, they're plopped into this perfect place. It's paradise. I want you to think about this. Sin hadn't entered the world yet, so there was nothing broken. There was nothing missing. There was no fear present. Actually, the Bible says it this way. They were naked, but they felt no shame. There was just complete innocence. And so it was, it was so perfect, as a matter of fact, I just want you to wrap your mind around how perfect it was. There were mosquitoes, but they didn't bite. And the only people living there were naked, so that's how you know it was a miracle, you know? I mean, think about this. There were lions and tigers and bears, but no, oh my, you know, like they just had the disposition of a dog. Um, I mean, everybody was vegan in the whole garden, beasts included. Like it was just, uh, that was the only thing broken about the garden, by the way. But um, anyways, my wife's a vegan, thought I'd have fun. But it was this perfect paradise. And then get this, this is what God does. He, He says, I have these two people that I've made in my image, man and woman, They're in this paradise, and now I'm going to give them a purpose. And so not only do they live in this perfect garden, and this is is just a fun fact. It's just speculation, but I like to believe that it's true. There were trees all over the garden, and these trees had exotic fruits you've never heard of. I like to believe there was a Ben and Jerry's tree. You know what I'm saying? Like, just that was the fruit, just a fresh pint of Ben and Jerry's. And when you picked it, a new one came. And because there was no sin, there were no calories. Come on, somebody. I mean, you couldn't gain weight if you wanted to. There was a Handles tree there. Graham Central Station just every time. Boom, boom. Got me preaching today. But get this. Then God says, all right, you're in this paradise, but I'm going to give you a purpose. So not only do you live in the garden, but now I want you to tend the garden. And he uses this word dominion or authority. He says, I'm giving you authority over the beasts in the field and the birds in the air. Everything you can see, you're responsible for it. And he says, I'm going to have you tend the garden and cultivate the garden. I want you to know that this is your purpose. Everything you see is yours. And then this is by far the coolest part of their whole setup. They live in paradise. They have a purpose. And get this. And they have a personal relationship with the God who made them and loves them. 
You can't get any better than that. And so I want you to understand this if you're new to God. God did not make them so he could just be this distant, far off, disinterested God. Like he, he wanted to know them in a personal way. I believe they were besties. I think they had inside jokes. I think they had games that they liked to play. We know this for sure. They met up in the same spot of the neighborhood every night and they walked together. This was their relationship that they had with each other. So it was personal. And I just want you to get the picture. They had everything they could ever want. Life was perfect. But then it didn't stay that way for long. If you know the story, next comes what we would call the fall. And entering the picture is Satan. And he comes in the form of a slithering serpent. And if you know the backstory of Satan, he was once called Lucifer, and he was one of the archangels in heaven, and he would lead people in worship. And actually, the Bible says it this way. It says he was the most beautiful creation that God ever made. And so that, that knowledge that he was the most beautiful began to get to his head. And he used to lead all of creation in worship targeted to their creator, but somewhere along the line, he started to be convinced that he didn't need to worship his creator, but that people needed to worship him. And so pride comes before a fall, and that's exactly what happened for Lucifer. And so he's robbed and stripped of his purpose of leading worship in heaven, and he's kicked out of heaven, and he falls to earth, and he is spending the rest of his existence on earth trying to rob other people of their purpose. That's his mission. And I want you to think about how good Satan is. We know that he's the father of lies. He comes to steal and kill and destroy, and he's really good at it. And this is how good he is. He took two people who had everything, and he convinced them that they needed to search for more. This is what happens in the garden. And so he comes to Eve, and he says, hey, I know you see all of these trees, and I know they're beautiful, and their fruit is amazing, and I know that all of this belongs to you, but what about that one tree? And he points to this tree, and they were like, what tree? And he said, that one. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because you know why God doesn't want you to eat from that tree, right? Because if you do, you'll be like him. And he starts to pollute and contaminate their perspective, and he tries to get them to think that God is holding out on them. And so as the story goes, Eve takes the fruit, eats the fruit, gives it to Adam, and he does the same in paradise is lost, and sin enters the picture. And uh, just this is just a fun fact. The reason I think that women have such a hard time picking where they're going to eat is because the first time that they did, they doomed humanity. I went there, <laughs> kidding, kind of, just having fun. But, but from that moment, sin enters the picture, and sin separates us from God. So this God that made them and made us to have a personal connection with him, he can no longer commune with them. He can no longer connect with them because of sin. Sin literally means to miss the mark. And the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. And the price or the wage of sin, what we get paid for when we sin, is death. And so when we live a life where we follow our desires, ultimately it leads us to the dead end that we were searching for. It leads us to death. And if you're looking for a good working definition of sin, I just wrote it this way. Sin is the result of finding satisfaction in something that wasn't designed to give it. James chapter 1, verse 14 says it this way. But each person is tempted when they are lured and enticed by their own desire. And then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so this is the story of the start of mankind. It's our search history, if you will. And so today, Easter at Believer's Church, I want to ask you a simple question. What's your search history? Because what we search for says a lot about us, huh? You ever just been searching and like, you're, you're like, I never thought about how dumb this is, but now that I like see it on a search history, I'm like, that's a really stupid thing to search for. That's my life every day. But some of us, we have maybe some more serious things we're searching for. And what we're searching for says a lot about us. Maybe, maybe there's an image we want to project to the world outside of us, but then with just our thumbs and the privacy of our home with the internet, we can see some of the honesty of our heart and our soul and what it's really searching for poured onto the screen. Like for, for some of us, maybe we're searching for a relationship. We're searching for somebody, 
someone. And if I could just have that relationship, then I'd be satisfied. Then I'd be fulfilled. Uh, Maybe some of us are searching for status. If I could just have these letters in front of my name, if I could just have a degree from this prestigious school, and then I could go to this place, and I could earn this kind of money, and I could have this kind of house, and I could drive this kind of car, and then this kind of person would want to be with me. And so that's kind of our pursuit in life. Maybe for some of us, we just want to feel something, feel anything, because we feel numb inside. So we're searching for an experience. We're searching for a pill. We're searching for something that we can put in our body so that it can just give us a momentary a momentary glimpse of happiness and fulfillment. But all of us are searching for something. What does your search history say about you? And today, what I want to do just for the next couple of minutes, I've come to this realization in my life that I've heard the story of Easter and I've read the stories in the Bible and I've heard about these people for so long that it's easy for me to have kind of this cognitive dissonance. It doesn't even feel real. Sometimes you ever just been reading the Bible and you're thinking, this feels more like a fairy tale than it does in a historical account. And so today, I want to try something, and I think it'll help you connect the dots. I want to take some modern-day people, people that live right now in 2023, and I want to draw the connection with some of the people that Jesus encountered in the Bible. Because every person that Jesus met, without exception, they were searching for something to satisfy them. Are you ready? So let's jump in. I'm just going to give you a couple. Here's the first one. This woman has always fascinated me. We don't know her name, but we call her the woman at the well. And we call her the woman at the well because you guessed it. She was the woman at the well. And so Jesus encounters her. He's, he's uh, talking to her, and she's a Samaritan woman. So there are a couple strikes against her because in this culture, men didn't talk to women. And secondly, a Jewish man certainly didn't talk to a Samaritan woman because they were like the lowest rung on the religious ladder. They were thought of as sinners. And so here Jesus is, he's talking to a sinner, and it's fitting that he finds her at a well, because in 2023, you know what we would call this girl? We we would say she's thirsty, you know what I'm saying? Like, and here's why we would say it, because if you look at her conversation with Jesus, he's talking to her about the relationships that she's been in, and you start to recognize that she's currently with somebody, but it's not the first relationship she's been in. She's been married five times before, and so She's looking for love in all the wrong places, and she swiped right so many times, but every time she swipes right, it's wrong. And no matter who she thinks is going to satisfy her, it leads her to the same dead end. And then we discover this about her. The person she's currently living with isn't even her husband. And can you blame her if you swung and missed five times? I don't know if you'd want him to put a ring on it just yet. And so this is where she finds herself. And I was just thinking, I promise I'm not doing this to put this person down. I was just trying to think who in our culture has been married that many times. And I thought of Kim Kardashian. No shade, just just the person that came to mind. She's, She's been in a lot of relationships. And so I just want you to imagine as Jesus is having this exchange with this woman, can you just imagine Kim for a second? Here's a real person that we can think of, a real person with a search history. And I I don't know, I have to imagine that both of these women, we know Kim's backstory, but I have to imagine the woman at the well had a backstory. I mean, maybe it was because she didn't have a good relationship with her biological father. Maybe she never received love in a healthy way. Maybe there was trauma, maybe there was abuse, but for whatever the reason, here she finds herself searching and running into the arms of other men. And this is what Jesus says to her in this moment as they're standing next to a well in John chapter four, verse 13. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water, the water from the well, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Maybe you find yourself in the same position as the woman at the well. Maybe you're the man at the well. But maybe you're thirsty and you're trying to satisfy that thirst with someone but it's the wrong someone. And today, Jesus wants your search to end with him. Here's the second person. We call him the rich young ruler. This guy's always fascinated me. Again, we don't know his name, but we know this. He had a lot of things going for him. He was filthy rich. He was young, so he had the rest of his life to spend his wealth. And he was a ruler, or he had authority. He had influence. I think today we could call him an influencer. 
he for sure had a blue check mark next to his name on his profile. And not the one that you pay 15 bucks a month for, like a legit blue check mark, right? He had influence. Now, when I think about uh, 2023, my mind goes to somebody like Logan Paul. He's an influencer. He's got 23 million subs on YouTube and counting. I think this is just according to the internet. $45 million is his net worth, not too shabby, pretty young. He's in a good spot. But it's interesting because if you follow Logan Paul recently, he has a friend named Georgie, if you listen to their podcast, Impulsive. And Georgie is pretty outright about his faith. And Georgie's got a little bit of a potty mouth. He's still working on some things, but he really loves Jesus. And he witnesses to Logan all the time. And Logan's just one of those people that he's searching and he's just not quite there yet. But he's like near to the kingdom of God. Some of you have been near to the kingdom of God. And today there's something in you that says, I'm ready to enter the kingdom of God. And so the rich young ruler, he asked Jesus a question. Maybe it's a question you're wondering about today too. He says, what must I do to have eternal life? It's a good question, right? Like if this life is just like the snap of a finger in comparison to eternity, I would wanna know where I'm gonna spend the rest of my eternity. And so that's exactly what he asks. And he thinks he has a good answer. He comes to Jesus and he's like, hey, I've kept all the commandments. I'm a good person. Jesus, if you were to stack my good works next to my bad works, my good works are way up here. I'm just a good person. And Jesus, I want you to see what he says to the rich young ruler. And he's saying it to Logan Paul and he's saying it to you too. Look at this statement, Mark 10, 21. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. I like that. Because this shows us the kind of God that we serve. That even when somebody is searching and even when they don't know if they have all the answers, even if you showed up today and you're not so sure you believe in God, can I just tell you that the Savior is looking at you with love? He loves you. But then look what he says next. He said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth and come follow me. Verse 22, the man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let them go. Oh man. That guts me a little bit because I've been in that position. And I don't know about you, but in my relationship with God, Jesus just has this way of finding that one thing. You know what I'm saying? That one thing that I'm just not ready to let go of. And he says, if you can give it to me, I can become your one thing. And so I want to make this point. Jesus encounters a lot of really wealthy people in the Bible. And this is the only person he encounters with great wealth where he invites him to get rid of all of it and to come follow him. Because I want to say this, it's not bad to have wealth. It's not bad to have money. It's when money has you. It's when it becomes an idol in the place of God. And so really what Jesus was inviting the rich young ruler to do, this influencer, he was inviting him to transfer his trust from himself to Jesus. Because really what the rich young ruler was doing, this influencer, is he was searching for his self-worth through self-sufficiency. If I could earn this much money, if I could have this much in my possession, then I wouldn't need anything from anyone else. And that's exactly what Jesus was getting at. And he said, listen, I'm calling you to be all in with me, to push all the chips to the center of the table. It's a great expression. It's been around for a while, but it's this. God is saying, if he's not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. That's really what he's saying to the influencer. And so that's my question to you. And can I just make an observation? I know I'm talking to a lot of people who would identify as a Christ follower, but I think a lot of Christians, they have just enough of the world to not enjoy Jesus, and they have just enough of Jesus to not enjoy the world. And so they're kind of just like straddling the fence of their faith, and they've got one foot here and one foot there, and then we wonder why we're miserable. I think Christians, if they're not following Jesus, are some of the most miserable people on planet Earth because we know so much and do so little with it. I, I I love this idea because I think for all of us, the lie is the same lie that Satan fed Eve, that the world has something out there that God doesn't have. Can I just tell you something? No matter how much you love the world, it will never love you back. One person said it this way, ladies, where's your hot girl summer when you're pregnant? 
right? Where's gangster rap when you're in prison? Where's the casino owner when you've lost your life savings on the table? No matter how much we love the world, it will never love us back. We're searching for something and somewhere that can't satisfy. Here's the third one. This is going to bring you back to Sunday school. Anybody remember Zacchaeus? Y'all know what I'm about to do. Can you do it with me? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Oh, man, the other service did it so much better. He climbed up on that sycamore tree because the Lord, he wanted to. Nice. That was awful, but I love you guys. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a little bit sketchy in his business dealings. He was a tax collector, and actually the Bible says he was a chief tax collector. So in the Jewish community, they hated this guy because the Roman government would use Jewish tax collectors in in their ploy, and they would turn them against each other. And they would say, you can can take the taxes and collect them for, for Rome, but then you can take some more off the top. And so he would pad his pockets, and he was just thought of as the most filthy sinner you can imagine. But Jesus comes to town and changes everything. I was trying to think through who would be somebody that we could relate to in 2023. And maybe 10 years ago, I would have said like Bernie Madoff. But how about this one? This is hot. This is fresh in the news. Sam Bankman. And uh, if you're a crypto person, you know he ran one of the largest crypto scams there's ever been. Stole billions of dollars from people in this big Ponzi scheme. And he's currently, I think his bail was like $250 million. And he's going through this whole court case, probably going to do some prison time. But I just want to make the point, this was the type of person Jesus was talking to. Not popular. And Jesus comes into town and Zacchaeus is searching for Jesus because he gets wind that Jesus has been setting people free. And he thinks, I need some freedom. Maybe he can do that for me. And so he climbs up on this sycamore tree because he's short, must have been Italian. I don't know. His, I, I feel his pain. And, and so he gets up on the sycamore tree and Jesus sees him in the crowd. Can I just tell you that Jesus sees you in the crowd? He sees people, not the pack. And he found Zacchaeus on that tree, and he invites him to come down, and then he does something that's so Jesus. Jesus invites himself over for dinner. That's just funny to me, you know? He's like, Zacchaeus, you've got a bunch of money. You're going to be paying for my filet tonight, and so he goes over to Zacchaeus' house, and rumblings start to happen in the crowd, and they start to say, Jesus is a friend of sinners, which is kind of funny because Jesus took that as a compliment. You know, he's like, yeah, that's, what, that's why I came. I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick. And he comes to Zacchaeus' house. I think it's the same thing he would say to Sam Bankman, that no matter how much money you have in this world, you can still be bankrupt in your soul without me. And look at what he says to him. He says, today, salvation has come to your house. So maybe for some of us today, salvation This is the day that it comes to our house, where it becomes personal. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't lead him to himself in the crowd? He said, I want it to be personal. I'm coming over to your house. God wants to get into every part of your life. He wants to come into every part of your relationships, into your career, into your family. He's coming to your house today. How about this one? This is the last one we'll talk about. Pontius Pilate, one of the main characters in the Easter story, And really what he was searching for was truth. Remember, he has this dialogue with Jesus when Jesus is on trial, and he asks him a really interesting question. It's a question people are asking today. He asks him, what is truth? You know, they lived in a culture that had relativity. It was was like, hey, truth is kind of this abstract concept, and your truth is different than my truth. It was very similar to today. And I was just thinking about who's the person that maybe we could relate to Pontius Pilate in 2023. You know who I thought of? Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is, he is searching for truth. The truth is out there. And you know, Joe has a little bit of a potty mouth too, but I love Joe Rogan. Like I don't agree with all of his takes, but I like, he's kind of a disruptor. Like I think if Jesus lived in 2023, I think Joe Rogan would have him on the podcast and I think they would break the internet. You know what I'm saying? Joe's a comedian. Jesus was hilarious. Joe doesn't do anything the way he's supposed to. Jesus did everything outside of the lines. I think it would be pretty interesting. But Joe is searching for truth. I've watched several people in the last couple of months just bring the gospel to him on the podcast. He's searching. But listen to what Jesus says in this exchange with Pontius Pilate. At one point in their conversation, Jesus, he's being tried, and Pilate says, 
You are a king then. And Jesus answered, watch this. You say that I am a king, but in fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. Now, how could Jesus have the confidence to say that? How bold, how brash that he could say that. But here's why he could say it. Because Jesus wasn't just delivering the truth. Jesus was the truth and is the truth. What did he say about himself? I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except me. And so this is why Jesus could boldly declare and proclaim, I am the truth. And so I just want to ask you, what's your search history and what does your search history say about you? And just for a moment, as we get ready to wind down to a close, I want to introduce to you four people. These are real people that are a part of Believer's Church. One of them, I believe, is in this service today, Heather. She's a member of BC Boardman. And they're going to talk about their search history. Let's take a look. I lost my mother at the age of 19. And before she passed away, I was on my way home from college and she made a phone call to me. And in the phone call, the only thing she said to me was, um, Faith, I just want you to know I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I know him and I want you to know him too. My mom passed that September before I returned back to school. Um, I didn't follow up on what she had told me. It sort of like went over my head. I lived my own life. Um, I married at a young age of 21. And after 11 years of marriage, the, the marriage was, was failing and it led me to a point of desperation. Having children with um, no help financially, losing everything, losing the house, losing the car, not working. I used to go to camp, hunt, fish, stuff like that. And what happened at camp, stayed at camp, was kind of the family motto. Uh, so I just come home and couldn't get rid of what happened at camp. I smoked my first joint when I was 12. That, just to be honest, and was uh, doing a little bit of this, a little bit of that, maybe some drugs, alcohol, things at uh, right around the 12, 13 year old range. I was very empty. I felt like I was raised by absent parents. You know, I was raised by my mom and my, my stepdad, and um, my mom was never home. She was always working two jobs. My stepdad was more involved with my brother, um, and then my biological father wasn't a part of my life. I, he was gone for 15 years of my life and never found out about him until I was a teenager. And so I was constantly searching for some kind of acceptance or love or just to feel wanted. I felt empty inside, like I didn't know what I was searching for, what I was looking for, but I was looking for it. Parents got divorced when I was about 10 years old. I went to church the entire time I was younger and then just kind of quit going to church after the parents got divorced. And then you know, got into high school, started partying a little bit, and uh, you know, just kind of lost my way a little bit. And I just came to a point where I just felt like absolutely miserable, felt like I had really no purpose or meaning in my life, just felt like I was just wandering around through life aimlessly with uh, no, no purpose, like I said. And I was just feeling so miserable and just lost on the inside. Along my journey of searching was drugs, alcohol, sex, outside of my marriage, uh, very badly distorted view of people, of church people. Uh, I ran and ran and ran and I ran hard. Ended up going into like this addiction with, with relationships and men. And that's what got me down the path that I went down because it went from abusive relationship to abusive relationship to abusive relationship where I was at the bottom of the bottom until it got me to the point where now God's like, you know what, I'm gonna sit you down because you're not listening to me. You keep going down the wrong path. You think your way is better. Your way is not better. So I'm gonna sit you down. You're gonna find me now because I'm taking it all away from you. So I remember the rock bottom point for me being I was just at a friend's house and just remember in the bathroom by myself and I just looked in the mirror and just uh, you know looking at myself and just you know, absolutely miserable. Just started crying my eyes out, just wondering like, how did I get to this point in my life? And um, 
you know, that was really rock bottom for me. And I, I went that entire weekend and just kind of binged the whole entire weekend. And then I, I woke up on a Monday morning and something was just different in my life. It was like someone was just praying for me literally all night long and something just broke. And uh, just remember sitting down, sat in this recliner, I was living at my mom's house at the time and just cried literally all day long. And uh, you know, that was a Monday and then uh, started going to Narcotics Anonymous meetings. And then just on Wednesday, I went to, went to church and that was pretty much the beginning of it all for me when things started to change for me. It was Easter Sunday coming up that weekend and I was determined that I was gonna have a leg of lamb for Easter. I was gonna do this thing up. <laughs> and I remember going out grocery shopping but ran across a school friend who asked me what I was doing for Easter Sunday and I said nothing. And she said, well, would you like to come to church with me for Easter? And I said, I certainly would. And that Sunday, Val came to the house, picked me up for Easter, and um, I found myself at the altar that Easter Sunday, receiving Christ Jesus as my savior, as an adult. And um, I've been walking with Christ ever since. Never would have thought I would have been incarcerated for four years, especially with what they charged me with. I was heartbroken, I was lost, I was angry. I'm like, how can God, like, how are you doing this to me? Now, now that I know what I know, he didn't do it to me, I did it to myself. I put myself there and he said, well, go ahead, do what you think you wanna do. So um, other inmates there were like, listen, you need to go to church, like, and I told her, I said, no, God can't help me. I don't want nothing to do with him. He can't help me, he, got, he did nothing for me but get me to where I am. And within two, three weeks, maybe a month, I was, in the, I was in the prison ministry, I was serving in the church, and I was in church every single weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And this December will make four years I followed him straight every single day. And he completely flipped my life around and I found what I was searching for. And I was searching for my father and my savior to give me his unconditional love, his grace, his forgiveness, and all of it. And I search for it and run for it every single day. One of those things that started this whole thing was Tommy Nealon. In conversation with him was like, hey man, I'm willing to be your buddy. You know, and I said, well, can't do that without a beer, you know? And uh, so he said, all right, I'll buy you a case of beer. Really funny thing though, the next day I showed up to church because that was the deal. I'll buy you a case of beer if you come to church with me. Next day he didn't go to church, but I did. And I walked in and uh, something finally, after all these years, just something gripped me. Something, uh, the Holy Spirit started working on me, but I started to feel something that I'd never felt before. I started to feel a truth and a sense of uh, placement. I didn't understand it then, but I prayed and just said, Lord, I really don't understand what you got in store. I don't really understand how you're gonna do this, but if you want me to serve you, then make the way and I'll do so. It's not been a perfect walk, but God has been faithful and um, he's shown me so many things in his word. But knowing that I have his direction and a body that surrounds me to give me hope, encouragement, and truth, it's made all the difference. Really, there are no perfect people. And the, me the, the minute we begin to just get real with ourselves and get real with, with other people and just forget about what everybody thinks, um, that's when we really begin to experience you know, true, true healing in our lives, just when we get real and we get honest with other people. And, uh, you know, for me, church was the, the perfect place for that. You know, I thought there would be condemnation, but there was only, you know, grace extended to me. And, you know, when I got real, that's when I began to experience healing in my life. Try giving church a chance. I know that for me personally, I didn't, I wasn't able to find the amount of love he has and the forgiveness when I was in my cell reading my Bible by myself. I didn't find it until I was actually around other believers in the church with chaplains and pastors and being taught the word and feeling the ministry and feeling the Holy Spirit just take over and move in the room. And once you start to feel that, it will just grip you up and it'll take you and you just fall in love with it. Jesus Christ is the really 
the only true answer. He is the way and he is the life. And the only way to get to the Father is through Jesus Christ. If you're at a point in life where you are just searching and can't seem to find any answers, I would suggest that you would connect with people who are Christ followers because they are followers of truth and truth always rises to the top. There's a lot of lies in this culture and we need truth. Beautiful. Can we give it up for those four amazing people? <laughs> Heather's back there right now. Can we give it up for Heather? We're proud of you. That's amazing. We're just about done here. and I want to end by telling you a story. This is a story that's 26 years in the making. And it's, it's a story that takes place in China, believe it or not. There was this two-year-old little boy decades ago walked out on the front porch and his parents were occupied, didn't see him. These people came and kidnapped him, took him from his parents. And when they finally realized our son is missing, as any parent can imagine, they panicked and, and they launched this massive search and they ran through the streets and they told the police and they started searching in the city and they searched in the countryside. This search went on for months and they couldn't find their son. And so eventually the authorities, they had to call off the search. But there were two people that never stopped searching. Can you guess who they were? It was the mom and the dad. Actually, the dad, his name is Guo. And Guo would, he would get his motorcycle and he would put this big banner on his motorcycle. They're gonna show you a picture. This is the actual banner. And it had a picture of their little, little boy and, and then written on the banner, it said, son, where are you? Daddy is looking for you. And he would drive up and down the countryside and get this, he, he drove over 300,000 miles, two decades, went through nine different bikes. When he didn't have enough money to stay at a hotel, he would just sleep under the stars, never stop searching for his son, had this insatiable need inside of him to find his boy who was lost. And so after years and years, two decades of searching plus, guess what? They found the boy. And actually, I wanna show you a picture. This is the first picture, him and his mom and dad right there. The one that gets me as a dad is this next one. Oh man, that looks like a dad that's been looking for his son. And can I just tell you that this is the story of Easter this is the story of redemption. It's a dad who comes looking for his kids who are lost. And our soul searching was ended the minute that Jesus came in search of our souls. All the different things that we try to do to fill the void and find satisfaction in other places, it all leads us to a dead end. But when we discover that really a dad just came looking for his kids, it changes something in us. We have to respond to it. This was present in the garden when Adam and Eve ate the fruit and they realized they were naked for the first time. The Bible says they were, they were ashamed and so they tried to make clothes for themselves and cover up. We all do this. We all try to cover up in our own way. They're hiding behind the bushes and guess what God says? The same thing that Guo says. He says, son, daughter, where are you? Dad's looking for you. You know what I always think about? There is no cost that this dad wasn't willing to pay. No price he wouldn't pay to find his son. Can you imagine how much money he spent in gas? How much money he spent in those nine bikes? I don't think they were very wealthy, but he said, I'll spend whatever it takes because you're worth that much. And listen, this is what God did for you. He bankrupted heaven with his only son and he said, this is what I'm willing to pay my son's life for your salvation here to end your searching. I love that the dad put it on a sign because when Jesus hung on the cross, it was a sign to the whole world. He said, I love you this much. I love you enough to lay down my life for you. You know what's crazy to me? The son that the dad was searching for didn't even know he was lost. 
know what the Bible says about you and me? It says that while we were still dead in our trespasses of sin, before we even knew we were a sinner, Jesus saved us. He's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It was always the plan. Maybe you think like, Joe, I'm not worthy of this sacrifice. I think you got the wrong person. I don't know if I'd ever be a great Christian, not the Christian type. You know who Jesus' first convert was? It was this guy hanging next to him on the cross. He's called the thief. This is the last person that Jesus talks to on earth, and he's the first person he sees in eternity because the thief turns to him and he says, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus tells him and he says, this day you will meet with me in paradise. And you know what the thief didn't do? The thief didn't learn 10 Bible verses on the spot and he didn't join a connect group and he didn't go through growth track, I can promise you that. No, but he was just as saved. And that's the beauty of it. The Bible says that it's only by grace that we're saved. It's not by works that any person could boast. And so whether you've lived a perfect life or close to it, or whether you've made a mistake every minute of your life, all of us come to the level footing of the cross and we say, I need a savior. Thank you for searching for me. And now I respond to that. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Honestly, as a pastor and as just a Christ follower, this is the greatest privilege I could ever have, that I would just be able to tell you this good news, that your dad is coming looking for you. And so you're gonna fall into one of two categories today. Maybe for some of you, you're like, man, I have responded to God's searching for me. It's just been a while, and I've been kind of running in the opposite direction. And today, I just wanna come back to him. And maybe you can't remember a moment in your life where you said, Jesus, thank you for searching for me, and I respond to that. And in America, we have to make sure that we make a distinction between cultural Christianity, like the kind that we just inherit because our parents took us to church. So I'm not talking about your first communion or water baptism or being a member somewhere. Those are great things, but those in and of themselves cannot save you. No, Jesus said the only way to the Father in heaven is through me. I'm the gate, I'm the door. And guess what? He doesn't say you have to clean up and then you can come to me. He just says, come to me and I'll help you get cleaned up. And so I'm just gonna make a simple invitation. It's the invitation that changed my life. It's the invitation that changed Pastor Joe's life 43 years ago now. If you can't remember a moment in your life when you said, Jesus, I'm all in, and I don't have it all figured out, and I know I won't be perfect, but I received the free gift of salvation. I'm not even just calling you God. I'm calling you Lord. You're sitting in the driver's seat now. If that's you, I just invite you to do something really simple. I'm just gonna pray a prayer with you. And the Bible tells us this, you might not feel goosebumps, it might not feel like anything's different, but the Bible says a miracle takes place. And you can know, you can be guaranteed that when you die, you're on your way to an eternal destination, a place called heaven, paradise restored. You're with your father for all of eternity. But here's the best part of Christianity. It's not just you in heaven one day, it's heaven on earth every day of your life. So if that's you, Can you pray this with me? And anyone that's prayed it before, can you help us? Say this with me. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. God, thank you that you came looking for me when I was lost. So I surrender. I'm all yours. Thank you that you call me yours as my father. And I won't be perfect, but every day, From this point on, I'll follow you. I am a Christian. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, heads are still bowed. Eyes are still closed. This is the most important moment of the whole Easter service, by the way. It's the reason we do it. If you say, Joe, I can't remember a moment in my life where I prayed that prayer and made that decision. Man, we want to celebrate with you. The Bible says if one person prays that prayer, all of heaven goes into a party. Like, I mean, they're up there partying and celebrating. If one person prays that prayer, and so if that's you, I don't know automatically who prayed it, but I sure would love to go home today celebrating. 